Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to the Metropolitan for yet another Sunday at the Met program. It's especially rewarding to Barbara Weinberg and myself to see so many of you here to celebrate two great shows that are currently at the museum. We will have presentations, as you saw in the uh, promotional uh, material for the show, we'll have presentations on both exhibitions and then a special performance afterwards by um, a great uh, uh, brass band. And uh, I, I should say that uh, this is an opportunity, thank you for the slides, this is an opportunity for us to, uh, to thank not just uh, you all, but all of the lenders to these exhibitions. It's uh, a Civil War summer at the Met, and as you know, next week we're going to be celebrating the 150th anniversary of Gettysburg, those three days, July 1, 2, and 3, which really changed the course of the Civil War and uh, American history. Uh, I'm the curator of photographs here at the Metropolitan Museum. I'm also the curator of uh, the exhibition, which is on view on the ground floor. Um, the exhibition explores, explores the role of the camera during, during the Civil War, which was a watershed moment in American culture. Um, during the war years, from 1861 to 1865, um, 750,000 lives were lost, uh, and the medium of photography, which was just 20 years old at the time, matured and flourished in surprising and unexpected ways. And what survives from the period, um, what survives from the period is a remarkably rich photographic record of great complexity. And the exhibition, for those of you who have seen it, I would ask you to raise your hands, but none of us would see whether you had your hands raised. There you are, great. If you haven't seen it, you should have time a little bit at the end of the day. The show will be up, both shows will be up until September 2nd. Um, what survives from the Civil War era um, is a photographic record that's, you know, that, that lingers with us, haunting views of battlefields strewn with human remains, uh, emaciated um, uh, soldiers who have uh, survived a battle, emancipated slaves uh, being portrayed for the perhaps first time in their lives, medical studies of unflinching realism, and intimate likenesses of soldiers north and south preparing to meet their destiny. It's an emotional show, it's an emotional subject, and uh, I encourage you to spend the time and to open yourselves up to those images. We'll have, in the next 20 minutes or so, a chance to look at a lot of the pictures and to see what role the camera played in our society. It asks a question that I hope you will ask yourselves, which is, what is the role of the camera in our society? Why do we want to look at pictures of war? What does it mean that we live in a kind of perpetual war and yet we're not really seeing the kinds of pictures you see in the exhibition on view? So, working separately and in teams for Matthew Brady, if you only know one name, you probably know his name, and Alexander Gardner, Brady's great assistant, who then became his own uh, photographer and gallerist, and others, more than a thousand, perhaps two thousand photographers, worked in the Union and Confederate States and produced hundreds of thousands of pictures, perhaps a million photographs, made from 1861 to 65, that were actively collected during this period, that is the period of the war, and for the last 150 years. And I would say that these images um, uh, of people of all classes and ages um, were a direct expression of America's changing vision of itself. Um, the camera documented the four-year war and also mediated it, and it memorialized the brutal events of the battlefield as well as the consequent toll on the home front. And it was, in a certain sense, the creation of a vast treasury of American experience, a national visual library. And um, it did, this treasury and this act of, of documentation, did something that uh, the armies and their leaders really could not. I, I would argue that it, um, it defined and perhaps even, perhaps to unify the nation through an unrehearsed and unscripted act of memory making. Um, and through the new medium of photography, the exhibition, and I think just both exhibitions really, 
explore the legacy of the Civil War and perhaps why it still looms large in the imagination and the character of the American public. So we're going to uh, take a journey through the exhibition and look at the ways in which the camera recorded um, the, uh, the lives of, 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 of the individuals who played a role in defining the time. Um, back just for a moment. Oop, sorry. Um, this is the kind of a picture that the Civil War photo photographers could not do. It is a Civil War photograph. It's made by O'Sullivan, who worked for Brady and Gardner. But we're looking at a stage set. The camera was not able to record movement. The exposures were very long. There were no shutters to the cameras. This is a stage picture of a drill. And it's a fantastic picture of, in Petersburg, sort of near the end of the war, allowing movement and stillness to create an image. It's this landscape view. This picture has been in the Met's collection since 1933. We acquired 500 photographs, Civil War photographs in 1933. It's a foundational volume, a, a collection of pictures, rather, um, that defined, in a certain sense, the photography program here at the Met. The war, of course, begins in a certain sense with the election of this man. Uh, you know him. He's not wearing his characteristic beard, his characteristic top hat. But what I think you will see is somebody who's looking into the future. Uh, this is made just days after he was nominated by the Republican Party to be the candidate for the Republican, for the, for the executive office. Um, we cannot see what the future is going to be on his face but he's looking strong. And that Im image was then part of a currency to get him elected. People wanted to see in the age of photography in the East what this guy that they'd read about had, uh, what he looked like. This is the kind of a picture you're going to see. I call this talk um, Shadows of Ourselves. This is the picture of Sojourner Truth. She was born a slave here in New York State. She was, uh, was given her freedom by her owner. She never learned to read or write. And she sits for a portrait. It's a very interesting picture, made in Detroit around 1864. And she adds something very interesting to the bottom of this picture. She copyrighted it in her own name, which was exceptional at the time. She writes, I sell the shadow to support the substance, the shadow being a, another term for the photograph, the likeness. And what is she doing? She's selling this picture to raise money for the cause she believed in, which is the anti-slavery effort. She's selling it for about a dollar. And when you see photographic albums during, um, uh, from the war, you will see that there are pictures of all different types of people, including this former slave. She's posed where? Um, in the studio, knitting. She was also a, a kind of feminist, and she believed that women were the moral center of the era. She sold this image, and she said as well, I used to be sold for other people's benefit, and now I sell myself for my own. This is the beginning of photography as an activist medium. You'll see that throughout the exhibition, there are powerful pictures that are only this big. They're four inches tall. They were the size of an iPhone. They were collected and were part of the currency of a nation trying to imagine a new way of, of um, being. The fight for freedom, the fight to end slavery was what the election was about and then the war became about. That picture of Gordon was made in Louisiana. He escaped from bondage in a Mississippi plantation. And what did he do? He went into the Union Army. The rest of Louisiana was still held by the Confederates, but New Orleans and Baton Rouge were controlled by the Union Navy. He went into a camp. He sat for his picture. This image was then distributed far and wide in the North as the great picture to show, to give an image to the reality of slavery. In, in a certain sense, what, what photography does is create a democratic form for all the people. It was not privileging one over the other. Here's a good image by a railroad photographer who worked for the US military railroads, A.J. Russell, and it's of a slave pen in Alexandria. These are the kinds of pictures that gave a face to slavery, and that face allows us to look back into time and to see the facts, the social facts of the time. This is a picture of those of you who have seen the show. It's an amber type. It's this big, the size of my hand. It's of two brothers in uh, Georgia. They have just probably received their uniforms, and perhaps the first time they're going to leave home. 
They leave behind this image. The idea of the picture, the photograph, is a talismanic object, is something we need to look at and to consider today. What do we think of pictures? How do we use them? How do we exchange them? These guys, the, the fellow on the left, the captain on the left, is not going to survive the first year of war. His brother will, and through his family, this picture comes. Um, here's a picture of Union soldiers right after they got their, their uniforms. They're posing. They're unsure of themselves. They paid a little bit more money to have a little bit of rouge on their cheeks and a little gold on their buttons. These were inexpensive objects. They were paid about $13 a month. And one of the things they did was sit for their portraits after every battle. The, the battlefield was followed by itinerant photographers who traveled from towns to the battlefront and provided pictures. It's the beginning of a new kind of idea of this democracy. Here's a boy. This is a Confederate picture from Charleston. We're going to have a band. I thought I'd uh, show you this image. He's, um, he's wearing a little Zouave outfit, a little sort of Algerian, North African-styled outfit. Again, he has a little bit of rouge on his cheeks and a little red and blue on his drum. He's posing for a picture by a guy named Cook, who was the Brady of the South. Here's a good example of the way in which people lived with pictures at the time. She's embracing these photographs. You can see, I believe, in her hand she has two. We don't know what the relationship between um, the sitter and the subjects that she's holding, but she knows that she's going to comfort them. We don't know if they're alive or dead. Regardless, she's holding on to them as if they were her own. This is the kind of thing in a, in a country of immigrants where the photograph takes on this very special meaning. Now, one in five died. One in five of those soldiers did not come home. Those that did were wounded, maybe for the rest of their lives, wounded physically and emotionally. This is a war that um, was photographed from beginning to end. It wasn't the first war. The Crimean War really was the first war that we had photography. But these photographs, this is by, again, O'Sullivan, working for Ex Alexander Gardner now, this is a picture called The Harvest of Death. It's a picture made by an artist who was there on the battlefield very, very quickly. Otherwise, the bodies would be buried, because that's the first thing they did, was try to get the bodies off the ground. What you see here is a picture that is kind of, um, in a certain sense, as, as, as a cornerstone to this, um, to this collecting of images, it's as, it's as important as a picture. What I didn't think I would ever see is this one. I don't know if you can tell, but we have a surgery on the field. This is a wounded soldier who's going to have his arm amputated. The surgeon is right here with his scalpel. This assistant is holding chloroform in his left hand or um, ether, and he's going to add it to the cloth to um, etherize the patient. These kinds of pictures, this is the surgeon's toolbox. These kinds of pictures shocked me because I thought I knew the history of the war, but I didn't. Um, the, the beginning of medical photography is the outcome of this war. What do I mean by that? We had surgeons who realized that if they photographed their patients like Reed Brockway Bontecu, if they photographed their patients as, the, as they were uh, taken off the field after surgery and upon release. They would create a mass documentation that they could use to train other surgeons. Read Bakwe Bontecu, look what he's doing. He's giving us the name of the soldier, Company F, 200th Pennsylvania Volunteers, and a number. This image is made by the surgeon who is caring for the patient. This idea, this collaboration between the wounded soldier sitter and the surgeon photographer created a new kind of language that is, I think, extremely interesting and one I hope that other scholars and, 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 and researchers will begin to explore. The war left behind extraordinary pictures. This is Richmond after, um, <coughs> excuse me, after the, um, after the taking of Richmond at the very end of the war. It's a kind of a landscape picture that we don't have. The legacy of the Civil War, leg legacy of the Civil War um, provides a baseline set of pictures for other photographers to look at. So when Walker Evans, the great Depression era photographer who worked with James Agee, went out with his camera in 1935 to photograph during the Great Depression, he looked back to these kinds of pictures as a point of reference in order to build a new language, the language of the sort of social realism of the 1930s. 
Um, this, is a, this is a photograph. Again, I never thought I'd see this. This is a color bearer, the, the soldier who carries the flag. Well, the flag is a target for the enemy to fire upon. And here he is. We know his name, Sergeant Alex Rogers. And he's posing for the camera in this sort of plein air, open air studio. And the beginning of the studio as the street, in other words, portraiture outside of the confines of a gallery or a tented gallery, comes from this period. Um, kinds of things you'll see in the exhibition, just um, ex exciting ways in which photography entered into the culture of America. This is a game board with uh, Lincoln, and I think you can see Lincoln right here. Lincoln and other Union soldiers. I, I never thought I would see this object, and there it is. It's actually patented in 1862. It was available for purchase. I don't think this had too much field use because it's in nearly mint condition. This is something you'll see in most people's homes at the time, and these are, these are lockets and, and pins with likenesses. The, the toll on the home front is something we need to look at, and the idea that you would wear an image on your person. You would wear that object, and that object had a, a particular role to yourself, the wearer, and to the public who gaze upon it. Um, part of the heart of this show comes from these soldiers whose names we may never know, who left behind these images behind when they went off to war. Um, to, uh, those were Union uh, lockets, and here we have um, a Confederate version. This is Jefferson Davis right here. These are paper prints set in little um, uh, vegetable ivory uh, lozenges. A vegetable ivory is a nut from South America that would have been white when it was new, so it would have looked just like ivory. Who would have worn this, I don't know, but we have uh, a really interesting tradition of wear the wearing of images. Here's, of course, Lincoln. Again, this is the picture that's this big, and I show this picture right now just to remind you that this picture went through the culture extremely quickly, and it let people see the president um, it was made on the morning of the Cooper Union address at Matthew Brady's studio, and it was then turned into things like the campaign button. This is a tin type. It's a one-inch size button. Don't miss it in the show. And then, of course, into wood engravings like you see here. This is a much larger image. It's laterally reversed. Same guy. This is right after he won the election. How photography entered our culture and where we are today is a, is, is, a, is a testament to that moment in the 1860s when it emerged as the potent medium, the salient medium of its moment. This is some of the rarest pictures from the New York Historical Society. I found this image and several others. These are made right after the firing on Fort Sumter. It's important to look at because this is among the last images that we have from the Confederacy. The first and the last. The Anaconda Plan, the blockade of southern ports, meant that southern photographers could not get supplies. So this is made on April 15th. It was uh, made by a photographer, Alma Pellet. We know very little about him, but it's a picture made of both Confederate soldiers and civilians celebrating their victory. Um, that immediately caused what? It caused um, the call for troops. So this is to join, the war has begun. This is to join an army group, come one, come all. Wanted immediately, 45 good horsemen. Um, bounties being paid. The show includes a lot of these images because I wanted people to understand the way in which soldiers were drawn into the army. It was not just by draft, or patriotism, but by the effect of not wanting to be drafted. Do not wait to be drafted. It's an important lesson. Um, the show includes Matthew Brady's studio camera. I show this now just to show you that the, to make a picture this size, they had to have a camera this big. There was no real enlarging at the time. If you had any question as to how thorough photography entered the culture, this is a patriotic mailing envelope, uh, and it's showing Jeff Davis taking Washington, the idea that no picture, I mean, no, nothing I could argue to you about the role that the camera played, in a certain sense, is ex can explain this. This is a caricature. It was uh, sold by a stationary uh, shop for soldiers. The idea that the only way Jefferson Davis would take Washington was if he was with a camera and was a photographer. I didn't expect to find this, and there it is. So I'm just going to show you a few portraits. This is a soldier here from New York from the 7th Regiment, you know, the armory just down the street. 
There he is, fully accoutred, ready to go. He stops on April 24th, just 10 days after the firing on Sumter, to have his portrait made on the way to Washington to protect the seat of government. Here's a soldier from Detroit posing very casually. He has not seen the battle. He has not seen the horrors of war. He doesn't know what it's going to be. Many thought that it would be over in 30 days. The first enlistments were for 30 days only. It's made by Brady in Washington. Um, again, another Brady in, in the tent. These folks had not seen the elephant. They haven't seen the horrors of war. Um, they're going to. They were collected, and photographers traveled and sold images in albums, little pocket albums that you kept in your pocket like this one. Um, these are the kinds of tents that photographers traveled the country following the armies and having their pictures. I don't know if you can see this, but right here there's a little, two little sticks. They're going to lift that up, and that's a glass skylight. That's where the portrait would be made. Look at the youth, look at the innocence, the sort of power of expression, looking into the future, not knowing what to expect. These are tiny little images, yet they pack a punch. And there's, there's the kind of pathos in their expressions. Since we have a musical program, I thought I'd look at this picture. This is a band member. It was made in Corinth, Mississippi in September of 1863. He's a slightly older soldier. Most of them were younger. He's, um, he's, he's written on his card, F. Wyatt, one of General Dodge's band, Corinth, Mississippi. He's a Yankee. Um, great picture of a 12-year-old drummer boy, uh, Johnny Clem. There's a great story about this guy. He, he ran away, joined the army. They rejected him. He ran away again. Finally, they accepted him, and he was caught with members of his regiment, and a Union officer uh, rode up on a horse and said, I, I, I see the Union is sending boys to do a man's job. And Johnny Clem, at 12, reached into his satchel and pulled out a revolver and shot the general. <laughs> he was immediately made a sergeant. <laughs> okay, sergeant, he's a 12-year-old sergeant. Um, this kind of picture, which you just do not believe could be made, these are um, scouts and guides, again, that same army camp in Louisiana, where we have two men who have run away, they're going to serve the cause for, uh, for the Union and to fight for their freedom and their brother's freedom. Here we have um, laborers at a quartermaster's wharf. And I show you this picture because in a certain sense, they have been brought from the plantations, coastal plantations south, up to the north. And what are they doing? They're posing for their picture now as laborers, laborers fighting um, to, uh, I mean, working to uh, keep the army going and to move the cause forward. Um, again, here's another picture of a field tent. And I don't know if you can see this picture of this soldier has just received his little amber type or tint type portrait. There, and there is the uh, skylight. These kinds of picture tents followed the armies, and that's why there are so many pictures. And in a certain sense, that gave birth to this tradition of democratic portraiture that is the true legacy of the war. Um, there's a detail of the image. Notice the color um, range. Um, we have a black assistant working alongside the white uh, photographers and assistants, and there he is holding his picture. I find it very moving. Here's just another soldier who's just gotten his uniform. He's stenciled onto his, the cloth on his uh, canteen, his initials. We know nothing about him, but the way he looks at the camera, we know that he is slightly worried about what will be next or this gentleman, an officer, holding his plumed cap. Or this fellow, we have on the left and the right um, two folks, two young men, one who I believe has not been to war and the other who has clearly seen it. And you can see the way they look at the camera is very different. There's a lot of meaning to be taken from that or these Georgia boys um, with their fighting knives. What I think you can see in this is that people look to the camera to find out who they were, and through the picture, we find out who we are. It's a beautiful thing. Another uh, Georgia uh, soldier with his fighting knife, his set jaw and the intensity of his expression might be his, his greatest weapon. We don't know whether he is going to survive or not, um, at this time, he does. But at this time, he doesn't know he's going to survive or not, but he's going to look as fierce as he can. 
Um, we also have all sorts of interesting things. I show this because of the band later. The Union Army con uh, contracted with drum makers to make drums. This is a picture that was made after the war to show you what uniforms look like, and there's been applied color so we could see what a soldier looked like. Gardner's sketchbook um, is a whole room in the show. It's a foundational volume of Civil War landscape pictures against which we judge all subsequent vo volumes of Civil War photographs. And we see these pictures of the Gettysburg dead. We see the very, very famous picture of a sharpshooter, um, a rebel sharpshooter at rest. There's a great controversy as to whether or not the photographer has moved the body and staged this or not. I leave it to you to, to read the literature. Um, but in Gardner's sketchbook, we see things like this. If you see these lines right here, these are the telegraph lines. This is the telegraph battery. There are three great things of this moment in, in cultural history. The railroad, the telegraph, the photograph. They come together during the war. Um, great huge cannons or mortars that were built. It's an unparalleled type of portrait of man and machine. We begin to understand the Industrial Revolution as it is applied to photography through Gardner's sketchbook. Um, this is the picture that the New York Times picked up and said was the last, you know, was one of the great pictures, one of the last pictures of the war. It's of a burial detail removing bodies from the field, removing them for proper burial. At the end of, uh, at the end of each uh, engagement, of course, there was a quick burial, and then after the war, we tried to properly bury them. Um, it's a picture really of black and white, as um, poignant as any that survived the war. Other photographers tried to make action scenes. This is as close to an action scene as we have. In war photography, we have much more, you know, Robert Capa, Cartier-Bresson, in the next generation, but this is as close to what we get. Everything else is much more still like this picture. This is the only photograph made by a Union photographer of Confederates that were not under the control of the Union. These guys are way across the river and the bridge has been destroyed, the railroad bridge, but the camera lens compresses foreground and background and now it, so it suggests a kind of intimacy. This is the kind of a picture that, that um, uh, Walker Evans would have looked at and modeled his, his uh, Depression era photographs on. I'll just show you a few more pictures of soldiers. This is a New York fireman who joined and became part of the Zouave group. Look at that expression. Richard Avedon would have loved this picture. Um, uh, parents and their children, even little kids dressed in, in Zouave outfits, as you see here. Here's Lincoln in the battlefield. You know, the pictures of Lincoln, there's not too many in my exhibition. Perhaps I should be faulted for that. But Lincoln and the war from a photographic point of view, most of those pictures were made in the studio. This is the only scene we have of Lincoln in the field. It's made at Antietam. He's, he's with a, an officer and, and Pinkerton, the head of his sort of secret service, this fellow right here. He's towering over Pinkerton. Um, this is Brady in the battlefield at Gettysburg. I think about this as we are about to celebrate it. He arrived so late to the battlefield that all the dead that we've been looking at had been buried. But he made a wonderfully reflective picture, literally a reflective picture. Um, and the only body in the field is his own. It's a very thoughtful picture and a very poetic one. Um, this is perhaps of Gettysburg, I mean, of Lincoln at Gettysburg to give the Gettysburg Address in the fall of 1863. Somewhere in here is the president. A few more pictures. These are from the western part of um, the war. Uh, Confederate soldier from uh, somewhere in the south. Um, a soldier wearing a raincoat. These faces and the way they look out at us are just very emotional, at least from, from, from my reading of it. Um, a, a Union soldier who's really seen the worst and is just barely holding on and looking to us to, into the camera to sustain himself, to hope for the best. Um, we also have in the exhibition women who posed as men and fought alongside men. This woman, Frances Clayland Clayton, posing um, with a suggestively placed uh, saber between her legs. And this fellow, you might recognize him as John Wilkes Booth. He's going to act in the most cruel way that one could at the time and will assassinate Lincoln at Ford's Theater. Here he is in the New York City studio posing as the actor, the great actor that he was. The causes of 
and the roles that the camera played are really quite amazing. This is a picture of a wounded soldier who's selling his likeness to raise money for his family. Here he is, Company G, 147th New York Volunteers wounded at Petersburg. There he is, a double amputee. Here we have another double amputee, a single amputee, and a blinded soldier. They were part of a living diorama at the New York Sanitary Fair in 64, 1864, posing live, and then you could buy the picture to help support them and the cause. Um, or this picture of emancipated slaves brought north to New York um, to have their portraits made to raise money to build the first schools in the South for African Americans, freed African Americans in New Orleans. And this is, these pictures were made. And these pictures were made and sold for a dollar each. Learning is wealth. There they are reading. It had been illegal to teach a slave to read in Louisiana. The advocacy with which the camera played a role in changing culture comes from this period. Um, same for this picture by a Confederate photographer of a, of a, of a, of a prison in uh, Georgia for the Union. It's called Andersonville. The uh, 13,000 died there, and those that survived were wounded for life. I don't think we would see these kinds of pictures um, for another uh, 70 years or 80 years until World War II. Um, Barnard's album, and we're almost closed for my presentation, Barnard's album represents the other side. He was an artist with the camera and photographed following Sherman's march. And these pictures are extraordinary. They're wonderful landscapes. Barbara Weinberg will show you another type of a landscape tradition. And these pictures were sold, made and then sold in another volume. It's the first monograph in American photography. And what's wonderful about these pictures is that he's trying to make art out of war. And they begin to look like a kind of new type of landscape tradition in photography with exquisite composition and, I think, a meaningful subject. Um, lastly, I show you some pictures of the wounded. These pictures made by Reed Brock Brock Brockway Bontecue Here's a patient that is being cared for. His leg, lower leg has been removed. But he, part of the care of the patient is through the medical attention and the camera's attention. We can see that these were part of a teaching album, and that teaching album survives, and in, it's in the exhibition. I strongly encourage you to look at it. These are some of the most memorable pictures, at least for me, because we begin to see healing, and that's what the country had to go through, the healing of the death of the president and his assassination, the healing of the country, the, re the creation of a new culture for freedom for all. And this is um, how the sort of show closes. It's a somber closing. The show has this emotional arc. Here's a memorial pin for Lincoln with a, a, a Gardner picture on, uh, on the image and uh, the hanging of the conspirators. It's heavy, but it's real. And we are better because we have seen the truth, we have seen the story, and now we can build out a culture that shows that change. Um, I close with this picture. This is George Barnard's picture um, in Savannah. And the, the truth is, and I, um, and, I, and I think you'll see it, is that the exhibition wallops a punch. It's a show and a half, as they say. Um, but uh, we need to find a way to recover and to build a society of freedom for all. And I think that it took a long time. We're still doing so. And I think the power of these Civil War photographs comes from the honesty with which these artists revealed the truth and the way in which, um, as a culture, we are still dealing with that hard, those hard facts. Thank you very much. <laughs>